Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm privileged to have been invited and privileged to have the uh, dreaded right after lunch spot where blood sugars are slowly spiking. And uh, so I give everyone permission to punch or poke the person next to you if you see them nodding off. Um, I do have to give sort of a brief explanation of, of who I am working for the National Council for Air and Stream Improvement. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm actually just going to riff off of, of Rick's comments earlier uh, because Nikasi is a similar organization, uh, but we are both narrower and broader in scope at the same time. Uh, we only work with the forest products industry, so the, the members that work with us are just forest products companies. Uh, we do work with academics and government and things like that, but the funding that we have all comes from the forest industry. Um, and instead of being based here in Alberta and focusing on Alberta, we are uh, actually international in scope, uh, both U.S. and Canada. So our head office is actually in, in uh, South Carolina. Um, I, I don't really want to get into exactly, you know, who we are and what we do, but uh, to give you just the, the broad strokes, uh, is our purpose is that we provide highly targeted research to help fill the gaps, again, for the forest products industry. Uh, we help inform operations, long-term planning, and strategic goals uh, as required. We provide technical support to companies uh, and associated groups. So if you think about certification organizations or forest products association, things like that, we provide uh, science and technical support to those folks. Uh, we work across species, jurisdictions, and government scale, so at both the provincial or territorial scale all the way up to the federal scale. Uh, and uh, like FRI, we do not advocate, and we are very, very strict about that, but I will advocate for good science. So we will advocate for science uh, and sound science and good research, but we don't advocate to governments as to what they should do, and we don't advocate to our member companies as to what they should do. We just provide the science behind it. So. In thinking about what we do working with our member companies, I wanted to tell you how we identify the research gaps that we want to go into, how we pick uh, the questions we want to work on uh, and, and the, the support we want to provide to our companies. So first we started back uh, in, in Canada, we've been here since 2002. Uh, we started by looking at the big pictures behind a lot of different uh, scientific concepts, be it um, key concepts related to forest management like fragmentation and tactness and, and sort of buzzwords you might hear, uh, natural disturbance variation. And then we looked at, at large scale uh, ecological or management paradigms. Again, uh, fire versus harvesting was, was something that we spent a lot of time on. Uh, predator prey relationships, particularly as they apply to things like caribou. Uh, so we, we built a number of uh, literature reviews, uh, technical reports that we made available not just to our member companies but to the public at large. Uh, and some of that ended up uh, falling into the peer-reviewed literature as well. Uh, from those work, we then got into some sort of state of knowledge and state of research reports uh, so we could understand the relationship between sustainable forest management and different things like woodland caribou, uh, watershed dynamics, and forest-dwelling birds. That was one of the reports that we specified. Now, within those reports, uh, we provide a lot of information about you know, what the literature says about different phenomena. But we always ended the reports with research gaps, asking the question, okay, what does the industry need? What do we need to go forward? So uh, a lot of what you're going to see that I'll talk about uh, right now is related to the research gaps from our Forest Birds uh, report that we published back, I'd be guessing, but I want to say 2006 or so uh, was when we published it. Now, um, there's an advantage and some disadvantages to appearing uh, later in the program, uh, and that would be that I got to listen to everyone else talk ahead of me, uh, not knowing specifically what folks were going to say. So uh, I came up at lunch and I had one more slide in. Uh, this is my addendum slide for me to say that uh, as much as I think what I'm going to talk about uh, is relevant and accurate and I'm, I'm very happy with it, I'm pleased to say that some of the presenters that we've heard already have already suggested that some of the questions that I'm going to poke at are being worked on or are being uh, looked at in the future. Uh, we heard Nicole talk about uh, validating models, and of course, Nicole's heard me uh, scream about validating models a few thousand times, uh, and uh, uh, Dr. Bain talked a fair bit about uh, some of the really detailed, tough to, tough to answer questions about why birds do what they do in some cases. So uh, I, I, I'm happy to see that uh, some of the things I'm going to talk about are at least being considered. So how do we ask the right questions? This is a, uh, as much a philosophical question as, a, as a, a practical question. And sometimes we have to go back 
to some of the fathers of, of science and, and philosophy like Aristotle. Uh, now Aristotle, uh, he's the, considered the, the father of modern science. He pushed back against his teacher and said, we actually have to consider observations of the natural world in our questions. Uh, and so that was in, in contrast to Socrates who said that was all crap. Uh, so uh, Aristotle said, no, these things are important. Uh, but Aristotle, he, he really hung on to that the ultimate cause for everything was a why. You had to ask why something is what it's doing or why some, some uh, process is being observed. Now, modern science has actually pushed back against Aristotle and said, yeah, why is important, but sometimes we can't answer why. If we think about gravity, we know how it works, but we don't know why and we can't really get there. We can still get to the why question for a lot of live systems, for a lot of ecological systems, and I think that it's important that we do that. So although there are many questions that need to be answered, strategic questions often start with the why. Um, strategic research questions uh, help proponents get ahead of issues before they become issues. If we understand what drives bird populations, not just at the very course they're associated with a certain habitat type, but why do those particular birds key into those habitats, what drives their populations from those habitats, then we have a better chance to manage those things on the ground. Uh, these better questions not only inform management, but they also inform regulation. If we understand, again, if we understand why populations are driven by what processes, it helps us inform things like targets. How many of a particular bird species do we want and can we get there based on the landscapes we have today? So these are, these are, are pretty big questions. So let me talk a little bit about some, some bird forestry related questions that, that I think would be, would be very valuable uh, from a forest research uh, perspective. So first of all, I think we want to look at research that links population level effects or goals that we might have uh, to whole community dynamics. Uh, we talked a little bit about this morning, uh, some of the, the uh, Alberta biodiversity stuff about you can look at individual species or you can look at uh, groups of species as a whole. And we can yeah. ask these questions about how many species or individuals can an ecosystem support? Uh, so that, again, speaks to things like BCR targets and why are the targets set where they are? Let's consider Canada Warbler. So Canada Warbler, we have data that has shown a fairly substantial decline over time. This graph starts in about 1970. Now, in the last 40 years, we have to think there's been a certain amount of habitat that's just been lost to urban expansion, for example. That habitat is not coming back. We're not going to bring back the outskirts of Toronto to forest land, for example. So we have to consider that in where we're setting our conservation targets. How far back do we want to set those targets? And then, if you combine that with a whole bunch of other species that might occupy the forest, we have to really think about how many of these various species can we pack into the forests we have left and how can we manage that. So these are really important questions about why targets are set where they are and whether they're the right targets we should be aiming for. We might also answer the question or look into the research to examine the extra Canadian effects on declining species. Uh, now this graph, I just found this the other day, this is percent change since, uh, again, since 1970. And we can see that those species that live in Canada year round and don't migrate are actually on the rise. We have more of them than we've ever had before. In contrast, those species that, that migrate distance yearly uh, are in more decline. The ones that go the farthest, so the ones that go all the way to South, South America, right here, are the ones that are in the most decline. Yet when we think about management, we focus a lot on the habitats we have in Canada. Is that the right way to go? We need to start asking why these species with longer migrations uh, decline more significantly and, and what are the population level effects here in Canada. So what's going on outside of Canada and how does that uh, affect our population targets and our population goals and whether or not we can achieve them. We know that a variety of species that live in Canada during the, the breeding season have uh, different levels of occupation in, in, uh, on the wintering grounds in South America. So everything from Tennessee warblers, which are not too bad, a little bit, you get all the way down here to your common nighthawk, which is a species that we've talked about already today, uh, have a substantial amount of habitat occupation down there in the wintering habitats. And we have to start thinking about what's going on there and put a little bit more emphasis into that kind of work. Research to test existing beneficial practices for their efficiency at helping targeted species. Again, we touched a little bit on this. 
Uh, and you know, Aaron, his group has done some work on what are the effects of different forest management practices and how do they affect populations, which is a, a great way to go. Uh, you know, snags, coarse wooded debris, landscape management uh, efforts, things like uh, green tree retention, corridors, natural disturbance emulation, and so on. But we really need to know why they are, they are important. What are those birds doing there? And what do they need those different habitat uses for? What do they need the different pieces of the landscape for? So these are important questions that we need to address, and we need to get down to the why. What's going on with those species? Why do they need those habitats? And then we start talking about our models. And we've hit on the models a lot today. We've talked about uh, these predictive tools, uh, about guessing, you know, once we start putting landscape practices on the ground, how do they affect uh, species going forward? Uh, I apologize, I should have actually gone to Nicole and gotten a better map than this. This is, uh, I pulled straight off the, the BAM website. Uh, this is Canada Warbler Habitat here in Alberta. Uh, so we've got these, these predictive models that we can use to run scenario planning and, and try and figure out what's going on. Um, how reliable are the habitat maps we have? Are they more or less correct? This speaks a little bit to the validation effort that we've, we've been talking about already. How biologically relevant are these areas? So as a manager, if we leave them on the ground, will the birds breed there? Will this be, you know, are these definitely things that the birds need or is this just where we have a lot of different birds? How long are they viable habitats? So if I leave a, a particular ground, say this is my Canada warbler habitat, I'm going to leave this on the ground, how many years will that still be Canada warbler habitat or will that senesta or, or change through natural succession to something else and will the birds no longer use it? That's an important question that we need to know. And then, and this is, it gets down to the why question, why are they important? Uh, is this habitat that's just an abundant habitat? And it might be, uh, if we talk about oven birds, because uh, Aaron talked about the, the, the number of birds that you know those Canada warbler that cluster in there. So it might be a little bit about abundance, but it might also be about productivity. And we really, need, we really need to know that. We need to know if these habitats that we're leaving, are they productive places or are they just abundant places? And there can be a difference between those two things. Uh, so this asks the question, you know, if I understand what's going on in those habitats, can I manage my landscape to make more habitat like that? That's very useful information. So for example, I too want to focus a little bit on the Canada Warbler. Uh, and I think a lot of the, of the thoughts here apply in some cases to other neotropical migrants, but I will focus a little bit on the Canada Warbler. Um, we know that in many jurisdictions, and I apologize, I don't necessarily have an Alberta-centric focus. Um, I guess I don't have the Alberta advantage in that sense. Um, but if we look at, uh, and I know there's some work that uh, Samantha presented on winners and losers in Alberta with respect to habitat. Uh, but in other jurisdictions, this is a, this is a figure from uh, Ontario. You can see that these different habitat types have stayed kind of stable over, say, the last uh, 20 years or so. Uh, with Canada Warbler populations going up and down. Uh, so it's not necessarily a habitat question in all cases. It may be in, in other jurisdictions like Alberta. Uh, but we know that in spite of habitat being relatively stable for Canada Warbler, we have this precipitous decline. Again, we have to ask if, if where we should be on this graph as far as our target goes. But we know there's this decline and we're concerned about it. So. The, the first thing we have to ask is, what is this bird doing in Canada? What, is, what are the habitat requirements and why is the bird keying in on those different habitats? What's driving the population? Uh, and then we have to focus on what's going on down here in South America. Uh, there is some effort going on right now through Partners in Flight to look at uh, Canada Warbler in South America and to develop recovery strategies around habitat down there to get a better sense of what's going on. Uh, but we really do need to focus on that. This is one of those species that migrates a long distance. So we have to think about uh, the wintering grounds, we have to think about the migration routes. There's a lot to consider for, the, for this species and it's not just focused on what's going on in Canada. And I'm not discounting the amount of work that we have to do in Canada to make sure those habitats are stable over the long term. I'm just saying that we need to look extra Canada as well. The other thing that I want to touch on just briefly is research opportunities. Um, and this speaks a little bit to the idea of adaptive management things happen on the landscape um, that we can't necessarily predict. Sometimes we know they're going to come along, these natural things. Uh, I'm going to take us briefly away from Alberta and look elsewhere. Uh, but in, on, on the east coast, this is uh, in Quebec and a little bit in New Brunswick, we're starting to see uh, spruce budworm infestation that's really taking over. And this is really providing a great opportunity for researchers to understand 
how spruce budworm might be affecting those populations. Again, there's a mechanistic hypothesis there that says that Canada warbler and other neotropical migrants might key into things like, like spruce budworm and really have a time with it. So here we have 2011, 12, 13, and 14 as the budworm infestation spreads. That's expected to dip down into uh, significantly into New Brunswick and farther over here into, into larger areas of Quebec. This is in some corners, we would say this is a problem if we are forest managers. Obviously, this is a loss of, of timber supply, but at the same time, it's a great opportunity in trying to understand the why questions around Canada warbler populations. What might be helping drive them, and what, what can we learn from that? Uh, so with respect to Canada warbler questions, we might ask these questions. These are the kind of questions. How many Canada warblers should we have? And we have to think, obviously, about habitat area corrected. When we've lost habitat that we know we're not going to bring back to Canada warbler habitat, that's an important question. So that helps inform a little bit of, of uh, where we should be on that time sequence. Uh, what are the habitat trends on migration routes and wintering grounds? That's a big one, in particular for this species and for any other long-distance migrants that we need to think about. Um, and then what other drivers are there that we need to consider? What other... Um, whether it's a natural driver or an anthropogenic uh, effect that we're doing, what are all the drivers that need to be considered? Because if we're going to manage for a neotropical migrant anywhere uh, and not consider all the things that could be pushing it, uh, we may have problems. Uh, do the models we have accurately flat reflect warbler habitat? Uh, and that's, that speaks a little bit to the validation question, and I know that, that BAM and others are working on those things as well. And then this last question about BMPs, are BMPs effective for maintaining breeding birds on our landscapes? So you can see my emphasis here is why, why, why? I want to know why things are as they are and what we should be doing about it in, from a forest management perspective. So broadly speaking, and this is, this is where I'm wrapping it up and I have no idea where I am on time, so good, bad, or otherwise. Um, so, I think we need to step, first of all, away from some of the pattern-based hypotheses. We do a lot of uh, monitoring, we look at different populations over time and how they're changing, uh, and then we say, okay, there's been a change here, and there's been, for example, an anthropogenic disturbance on that location, aha, there's our, there's our smoking gun. I think we really need to get away from these pattern-based hypotheses and look at mechanistic-based hypotheses and the causal linkages. Why are, are populations declining or in some, in some cases increasing? These are the mechanistic uh, hypotheses that re we really need to identify and test. So for all those of you who are grad students, yes, I'm advocating for mechanistic hypotheses. Um, we also need to ensure that broadly held hypotheses are based on empirical derived relationships tested and validated with new data. And I know, for those of you who are modelers out there, that kind of sucks. Because the more data you get, the better your models are. So there's a temptation to put all your data into your model. It's really, really important to either save some of that data, keep it aside to validate the model, or find new data to validate the models with. Uh, I can tell you my forest industry friends are awash with models. Uh, and in most cases, they don't know if they're any good or useful for that matter. And we all know that models are, well, what's the expression? All models are wrong some are useful. In a lot of cases, we have models that are probably wrong and they're not terribly useful. So we really need to get better at that. Uh, we need to test the effectiveness and efficiencies of various practices, uh, essentially asking that question, and again, I think this speaks to the, the CWS perspective, do these beneficial practices work? Uh, do they make a difference? And why or why not? What is it that the species are keying into when we leave green tree retention? What are the benefits? And why is it, why is it driving those populations? Uh, I would say we need, and uh, this is not a, a point I'm not suggesting here, we should cancel you know, Alberta biodiversity monitoring or anything like that. I think monitoring is important. Uh, but we need uh, less monitoring that isn't tied to an investigative process. Uh, we spend a lot of time collecting data, Let's tie it to processes that we can understand uh, and learn from, and then hopefully uh, train our managers to, to reflect those processes in a, in a stronger way. Uh, again, I want to link, I think we should link uh, community ecology and regulation and certification, put all those things together with all of these why questions that we need to address. Uh, and finally, take advantage of uh, changing landscapes for active adaptive management opportunities. Uh, when things come along that alter the landscape, that 
you know, we, we plan on doing through management or either uh, Mountain Pine Beetle, the adventure that, that came out of that, uh, we can learn a lot by uh, doing some adaptive management around it. So with that, I will take questions. I know I have a lot of them myself. There's my contact information. And yes, I know this is not a migratory bird. <laughs>